morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So good to see all of you here on this summer morning. We have a few announcements today. Um, first, thank you for so many well wishes for my birthday. I, I appreciate that so much. And, and we had a, a great time kind of celebrating and a chance to reminisce about life. And it's, it's, a, it's always fun to have a birthday and remember all your blessings and kind of review the year. And so, so thank you. We have baseball coming up on July uh, 14th. And we'll go over to the third base side. It's, it's fun just to go to the Bees game. It'll be our, our, our last official one this, this summer. So if you can join us, please do. And weather perm permitting, we'll be there. So we hope to see you for that. And then we have summer sacks going on again this week. We had a great turnout last week. But we do need one more volunteer for certain. So if you can be that person... Please see Susan Farnsworth after worship. Susan, you want to raise your paw? There she is, right back over there, waving her paw. And, and so please see her if you can volunteer for Summer Sacks this week. There's also a sign-up sheet out there. We also have T-shirts in. So if you would like a new uh, Presbyterian shirt shirt, uh, we, we have one right back there. Juan's wearing his today. Look at that shirt. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. So if you would like your shirt, they come in a couple of different colors. Sarah has, has some more of those in, or you can get, the, get them in the office. I think that's all of the announcements that I have. Hi. <laughs> he's, he's conducting all of worship. <laughs> Are there any other announcements today? Then let us center our hearts and minds to worship God. Stand as we are able for the call to worship. In the beginning was the Word, and the Spirit moved over the waters as the Creator set to work. Jesus told his disciples that when he left them, his Father would send the Holy Spirit.
seated, will the children please come forward for the children's time and two cent a mill offering? Rosemary. Hi. Hi. Bye. What do you know, smileys? That's how everyone feels about being up front. Yeah. <laughs> Here. Yep. Who makes noise? Noise makes me happy. Huh. I am serious. So something I am going to be serious about. Something I am going to be serious about is our lesson that we're going to do over the whole summer. So we're going to do a lesson on the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The fruit of the Spirit. And I have a little thing here that has all of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, do you notice that I'm saying fruit? Fruit is good for you. It is. And notice that I'm saying fruit, not fruit fruits, right? We say fruit of the Spirit because it's all of the fruit that comes from the Spirit, so it's actually plural, not singular, fruits. We get all of the fruit of the Spirit. So one thing that we say in the church is that we all have different gifts. Like Hudson has the gift of music. Thank you. Your dad has the gift of being an artist. I'm not a very good musician or artist, but I have the gift of talking and teaching. <laughs> we, we say that we all have different gifts, but when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, we all have all of the fruit of the Spirit. So one person isn't just loving, we're all loving. Your gift is being funny. I have that gift too. Some say. <laughs> we all have the gift of joy. Mm -hmm. We all have the gift of peace. We all have the gift of patience. We all have the gift of gentleness. We all have the gift of kindness and goodness. We all have the gift of faith, and we all have the gift of self-control, of self-control, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? Patience and self-control. We do possess those gifts. It doesn't mean we always use them, but we do possess them, and they're gifts from God given to us, and so we're going to learn how to use them over the summer. So one of the gifts that we all have, too, is the gift of generosity. And today I'm going to ask you to help me collect our two cent a meal offering. And if you would, go around with the buckets and, and collect from our friends in the congregation who bought their change to share with us to remember for every meal that others go hungry. And so if you would, go around and help me collect. You can take that little buddy. Walk with me.
Three. <gasps> Just like that. Good job. We'll take them out in a little bit. Yeah. You want to help me pray for it? Let's pray. Dear God. Oh, we got Hudson coming. <laughs> One more. <laughs> One more. He did. You want to throw it in there? Good job. All right. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for children in the church and for us being able to teach them how to give and how to share and how to have joy. We ask for your blessings upon the gifts that have been received from your people to help feed your people and to share your love and shine your light. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. You can go back to worship with your families or back to the nursery for children's church. Good job, buddy. In the community of faith, we confess our sins together. We confess the sins we know we have committed, and we confess the sins of our whole community, some of which we may not realize we are committing until we confess them. Our corporate confession admits the truth of our sinfulness. Our sins affect everyone. Let us confess them together. Spirit of wisdom, you have taught us. Let us confess our personal sins in silence. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Friends, believe the good news of our faith. Through Jesus Christ, we are called as friends, forgiven as sinners, and sent as servants. Thanks be to God. Please be seated and join me in prayer. Silence our restless minds, O Spirit, so that we may dwell in your infinite wisdom. May our lives be nurtured in the goodness of the word today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first lesson is from 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My child, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves the one he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy are those who find wisdom and for those who get understanding. For her income is better than silver, and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
to, to sit down. We were at my father-in-law's retirement last week. He retired from 40 years in ministry, and he's going to go and do what's called Macedonian ministry, which is where they do pastoral cohorts and then go to a trip to the Holy Lands after three years. But one of the things that he shared was, was that he, he served several churches, and, and one of the things that he said was the first church they went to in, in New Jersey when he graduated from Princeton, he said they loved him, and they nurtured him in the family. And that's how Sarah and I felt at our first church. And then he said, then we went to our next church in Laverne, Minnesota. And he said, and they loved us. And they nurtured us. And, and then he, he shared about some of the relationships that happened. And then they went to their next church where he was at for 18 years. And he said, and they loved us. And they nurtured us. And, and it just struck me. When, when people got up from those different churches that he had been at, they shared stories and they shared stories about some of the things he had said in sermons, and they shared stories about some of the mission trips they had been on. But mostly they shared stories about life together. And, and one of the things that they don't teach us when we graduate from seminary is that you end up falling in love with the people that you serve, and they become uh, some of your best friends through life. And they make you pecan pies and tease you about puns, and they, they celebrate your birthdays with you, and they... Yeah, they go to musical outings with you, and they and they love your children. And just listening to him share about all of that over 40 years made me look back and, and count all of the blessings that we have in, in our current ministry. So thank you for being such a gracious congregation and for loving us and nurturing us and accepting our quirks and warts and all of that good stuff. We're going to begin a series over the summer that I have wanted to do for some time since we started talking about some of the differences that we have in faith and belief and, and the way we see the world differently. And, and so we're going to start with the fruit of the Spirit, and we're going to unpack each of the fruit over the next several weeks through the summer until August. And so this will be our primary text for, for the summer. It's Galatians 5, 13 through 23. We'll mainly focus on 22 through 23, but I want to do the setup here. So this is, this is our scripture. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit. And what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you as I have warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, as we begin this new series, may, may we be fed and nurtured by your spirit as we learn what it means to grow into being the people of God, producing the fruit that you have planted the seeds of in us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. 
So how do we live as Christians in a post-truth world? I know not all of you were here over the past several weeks. In fact, I wasn't here last week when Mark was here, and I'm gracious to him for preaching that challenging message. But we've been talking about living in a world where we have different understandings of doctrine and dogma. And so how do we live as Christians in this, what many consider to be the post-truth world? Here's an excerpt from the book that I've been reading the pursuit of virtue, the path to a good future. It says, according to many futurist social scientists and cultural commentators, our modern high-tech, fast-paced consumerist world is becoming increasingly frenzied, fragmented, divided, and disarrayed. Many of us feel we are swirling about as psychology, of the father of psychology, William James, once said, of infants in a blooming, buzzing confusion without a meaningful and positive sense of overall purpose and direction. In a time when we possess more financial wealth, material goods and comforts and technological conveniences than ever before, many of us suffer from excessive egocentricity and untethered wishy-washy relativism. Information overload and dizzying speed and chaos in our lives, anxiety and stress, feelings of fatalism and nihilism, closed-mindedness, anti-intellectualism, and defensive paralysis in the face of change. We have a disproportionate reliance on money and consumerism as the answer to life and a hypnotic and addictive immersion in technology and social media. Of special significance, of special significance, our conscious sense of the future, as well as our memory of the past, is narrowing and weakening. We are becoming lost and forlorn, drowning in an overpowering present. What is going wrong, and what can we do about it? Nod your head if you think some of that applies to you. What about to the kids today? Oh, that's not fair. They're just kids. It's true. And the answer that many have given over the course of history to this same problem as society and cultures change is the pursuit of virtue, of pursuing some moral good but not a moral high ground, and we'll see why. So I just want to share with you what we covered two weeks ago uh, and review it, because some of you weren't here, but I want to show how we actually see and hear the world differently again. So you're going to hear... Laurel. 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 Laurel, 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 Laurel. Did you hear what I hear? I heard Laurel. Over and over. Raise, raise your hand if you heard Laurel. And I can prove to you that I didn't hear Yanni because that's not what it sounds What does it sound like? Huh? You're wrong. It sounds like Laurel. <laughs> we see and hear the world differently, literally. And we, and we, know, we know this is true from some other studies where people, when, when they've done the retinal scans, people will look at one image more than another image if one image is grotesque and they have more of a fear-based view of the world is the world mostly good or mostly bad they'll look at the bad image if they think the world is more dangerous they'll look at the good image if they think the world is more good and so we literally start to see the world differently so our bias confirmation actually widens the gap. And here's the thing. We're all listening to and seeing objective facts, but we're interpreting those facts differently based on what, cons- what confirms our beliefs. 
we see what we want, and that exacerbates the gaps in between us. Throw in social media, throw in TV networks with different political views, and that gap gets wider and bigger and grows into a chasm, right? Also throw in the fact that our minds start to trick us into seeing what we want to see. So here they are. Here they are. I got more comments about these strawberries. So, do you see what I see? Here are strawberries. What color are they? Red. They're not. There's not a single red pixel in this image. So what I want you to do now is I want you to take your bulletin and hold it up so that you can only see that strip on the bottom. Block all those strawberries and tell me what color is that strip. It's gray. Now, you see that gray strip growing up through the strawberries? Raise it up. And that's the same color, right? That strip is gray. But does it start to turn red as soon as you see the strawberries? Yeah. It's still gray. That's your mind. That's your mind changing your mind about an objective fact. Isn't that amazing? We have these brains that are out of control. They're out of control. Now imagine being a teenager with hormones and your brain's really out of control, right? Ah, remember what that was like. So what do we do with all this? When we add in emotions, an fMRI, which is, looks at oxygen levels in, in the blood as it moves through different parts of the brain so they can see where more blood is in the brain, it shows the same area of the brain responds as if a spider is on your face and you can't move. So nobody really cares about Laurel and Yanni, right? And, and we say, well, I hear this and I hear that, or with the strawberries or some of the other, the blue dress or black dress or white or gold dress. We say, oh, who cares? It's just a dress. But when we start throwing in things with emotional content, uh, content like was Jesus fully human or fully divine? was one of the ones that we used to consider people uh, worthy of being burned at the stake for disagreeing over. Or now we would say it's gun control or abortion or immigration. And we, and we literally feel when we start fighting over these things as if our identity is being attacked. And it's as if someone has put a spider on our face and we can't move. And that's how we feel. This is how my grandmother makes me feel when we start talking about politics, right? And so what, what we have learned is that we are not going to agree. And here's what Nietzsche said some, some almost, what, 400 years ago now. Nietzsche said the dilemma is that the world absolutely, absolutely needs some moral code and the problem is, is there is not one absolute moral code that everyone agrees upon. So, we seek the pursuit of virtue. And I want to tell you that the pursuit of virtue is not some lofty ideal. This isn't high-mindedness. This isn't self-righteousness. This is actually the lowest common denominator. To start at the beginning of an absolute moral code, you have to find something that is so horrific that everyone agrees they should not do it. For example, genocide. We think genocide is so horrific that every, every 190 people or 190 governments in our world agreed that we should not do it. And so we begin with this basic bottom, thou shalt not kill for no reason. And then we move up from there. You don't start with this high and lofty righteousness and move down. You start at the base. And this is the beginning of some absolute moral code. This is something like the Ten Commandments. At the very bottom of society, at the very foundation of how we live together in society, we say, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, 
or, in other words, be honest, a firm mind, if you had to do it in the reverse. They sound high and lofty, but really, they're these very basic things. So one of the things that happens is that, is that we say as Christians, the reason we need to do this is that as Presbyterians, we say that we are totally depraved. Have you ever heard that word before? Totally depraved. Calvin would say we are worms. We can't do the good we ought to do because we are no good whatsoever. He equates it to the fall and just says, now, this is part of humanity. And so we have to have the pursuit of these virtues and thank God for the gift of the Spirit or else we would do no good at all. We think we do good on our own, but he said it's only because you have heard of something good through God and Christ and the Holy Spirit that you do any good. I'll give you an example. How many of you were, were the Yannies? The Yannies. Okay. And Yannies, I want you to turn around and find somebody who's a Laurel. Laurel, raise your hands. Laurels? All right. Do you have a Laurel? Do you have a laurel? Okay, laurels, laurels. Okay, there's a laurel. Now, yannies, yannies, look at each other. Look back to your yannies and say, if you were dying, I'd give you a dollar. Right? If you find another yanny, would you give that yanny a dollar? Right. Okay, now turn to the laurels that you just found. And laurels, and I want the yannies to give the laurels a $20 bill. Don't, don't ask why. Just, just just, do it. Now, okay, stop. <laughs> Here's the thing. You should already naturally hesitate to give somebody outside of your tribe $20. It is, it is in our nature to say, you're not one of me. I'll help my own first, right? It's, it's in our base nature. Do you remember that Stanford prison experiment that happened uh, in the 70s where the Stanford Psychology Department took, they took 25 students who all performed these psychological evaluations. They were mentally stable, emotionally stable. They didn't have any uh, tendencies to violence or anything like that or authoritarianism. And they, they randomly picked 11 to be prison guards and, and um, 14 to be the prisoners. And they went, they arrested them the prisoners in their houses and they and they took them to this makeshift jail in the basement and within three days these were students and they all knew this was just a research program within three days they had to shut the whole thing down because the prisoners had rioted against the guards and the guards had began to beat the prisoners in a research study we are base human beings I can, I can prove this in another way about three days ago, I, I missed a meal. <laughs> Patience, self-control, kindness, generosity, all out of it. All out of it. And so we need these virtues. And we learn, we learn something from Scripture here. And this was the history of Galatians. So... We see how we're so divided just on some little things, how we're so based on just a few little things. Uh, this community was too. They didn't agree on how to see the world or what the common bottom line for the base of their virtues should be, but they did agree we at least should have these virtues. So they didn't agree about whether you could eat bacon or whether you could eat pork or when you had to wash your hands or when you had to do your fasting, because one group fasted and one group didn't, and they were literally ready to kill each other. Right? These were big things to them. But then what they learned was that in order to live together, we need to have some of these basic things. And that's where we got Paul's letter, where he was building not on something that he just originally thought of, but something that was gifted to him through the Holy Spirit. And that was the fruit of this spirit, which is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, which will translate as generosity, and we'll get into that in a few gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And it was the believers 
that these virtues would teach us how to live together. So here's what we're going to explore. Next week, we'll look at love. And we'll look at love as it exists for us today in a world where we think in order to get or receive love, we have to have some exchange of value. You have to buy a diamond ring or a diamond necklace or some earrings to receive love. You have to buy your husband a barbecue pit to receive love, right? And we work on this exchange, and so we'll compare that. And, and we do the same with joy. We compare joy with manufactured desire. And we'll compare peace with fragmentation. And we'll compare kindness with self-sufficiency and goodness with self-help. And faithfulness with impermanence. And gentleness with aggression and competitiveness. And self-control with addiction. And so we'll look at and so for today, today, the good news for our lives is that we already possess all of these. They're gifted to you from the time of your birth through the Holy Spirit, but they are disciplines. And they have to be more. And so over the summer, we will come to So just for today, let us give things that in the midst of seeing our world differently, in the midst of divisions, knowledge Anything we want and everything we want, we still have the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the Lord, Jesus, faith, love, kindness, faithfulness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so may we continue to learn and grow for living in those ways. In Christ's name, amen. stand together and say what we believe, reciting the newest confession for the Presbyterian Church from the Belfar Confession in Africa. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the Church through word and spirit. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, 
the communion of saints called from the entire human family. Therefore, we reject any doctrine that absolutizes the faith in such a way that hinders or excludes any person or peoples from the unity of the Church in Christ. Centered in the heart of God through worship and, and hearing His word, let us now take our prayers to the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the church. We ask that you enliven the church for its mission that we may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe fresh life into your people and give us power to reveal Christ and word and peace. We pray for the world. Creator of all, lead us and every people into ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for community. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ to one another and love as he loves us. We pray for those in need. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. Most holy God, we pray this day for ourselves, that we may feel your spirit at work within us. 
enliven us to the gifts that you have given each of us and to the fruit which is born through you and all of us. Grant that we may minister in your name with your love in our hearts, with your truth in our minds, and your strength in our wills. We ask all of this in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go from this place and have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be known to you and those you love. Now and